Thank you so much for this uh, kind introduction and of course thank you very, very much for the invitation to Le Leiden. I did not know, uh, I have to admit, how pretty Leiden was. Um, and uh, I'd like to explore the city some more. Unfortunately, I have to run after my uh, presentation. Um, I have to catch a plane. Um, so, um, I will be talking about uh, video games in the museum, about um, the significance of uh, video games as um, cultural artifacts. Um, and um, I will uh, start by uh, just talking about uh, the history of video games um, in the context of uh, ZKM, Center for Art and Media in Karlsruhe. Because um, ever since uh, our a uh, center for art and media in culture has opened its doors in uh, 1997 in a former uh, ammunition factory, by the way. Um, we uh, display and present video games um, as part uh, of our exhibition program. Um, so we, we identified them very early as an integral uh, part of an everyday digital uh, world and digital life. Um, here the ZKM has assumed a pioneering role. Uh, by contrast, it is only since November 2012 uh, that uh, New York's Museum of Modern Art has included computer and video games in its collection, mainly focusing on the aspect of interaction design. So, early on, uh, Center for Art and Media uh, recognized the importance of video games and how influential they are. In 1995, um, an educator and social worker called Friedemann Schindler and the designer Frank den Austen, um, they started to develop uh, a concept for an exhibition that would portray the different levels of the medium of the video game, which they identified as multi-layered. So, um, we have here a historic photograph <laughs> from 1997 showing um, the first video games at, um, at ZKM. So the first exhibition uh, featuring video games um, at ZKM was called Welt der Spiele, World of Games, um, and it was strongly influenced by an educational approach to media. The curators addressed various complexes uh, of issues in the, forms, uh, in the form of installations, for example, um, we see here an installation called License to Kill. Um, it engages, of course, with the portrayal of violence in a mass media. And this one here is um, particularly interesting. Um, you could play the uh, first-person shooter Doom in the museum, but you had to, um, you had to sit down in these dentist chairs um, uh, in order to emphasize the violent nature of the game. Um, today, uh, of course, um, it's a little bit different, um, but uh, Welt der Spiele, the World of Games exhibition, provided the basis for my work at ZKM uh, in, in um, well, conceptualizing a new exhibition um, called ZKM Gameplay. You saw some moving images uh, already uh, from that exhibition, and here I have some, some photographs. Um, Video games have evolved, of course, since 1997 um, and uh, are now very different to those from the early days. Classics like Pong from 1972 and Pac-Man from, from 1980 um, and contemporary games like, for example, Destiny or uh, The Witcher 3 or whatever um, are worlds apart um, technically, aesthetically, uh, and, of course, uh, all above commercially. Video games now exist in a diversity of variations, genres, and multi-faceted uh, forms, as well as various art scenes. Um, and they are now a very complex, highly complex medium. In the course of their history, the video, uh, uh, video games have developed their own specific uh, repertoire of forms um, and express, uh, forms of expression, of course. 
um, gameplay, the video game, the, my first video game exhibition at ZKM, um, traced these developments and presented the video game as a medium that uh, has achieved its own identity and, and now entered a phase in which reflection played a defining role uh, and self-reflection even of the, of the medium itself. In gameplay, the medium of the video game um, or my, my goal was to interrogate uh, the medium and um, to show the potentialities of the video game, uh, to, to put them in focus um, and not cementing its conventions. The selection of exhibits uh, prioritizes experimental, unconventional and artistic forms of the video game, concentrating on these potentialities of the medium demonstrates how diverse the subject is and at the same time allows its characteristics to emerge clearly. So, the idea of, um, of reflecting on the medium played a definitive role in the new conception of uh, the exhibition called gameplay. The games are subjected to critical scrutiny in, um, in, in um, uh, we have, of course, um, uh, people working at ZKM who do guided tours, who work with children and, 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 and uh, do all these uh, communications work. And um, they, uh, they, were, um, they were, or I worked very, very closely with them together in order to develop workshops, uh, special tours, and, and so on. So... Um, the, the exhibition gameplay presented the exhibited, uh, the exhibited video games and artworks in an interactive, playable uh, form where feasible. Visitors uh, are invited to play the games together and to engage with the works of game art. A game that is not being played is in a curious state of limbo, one could say. Uh, an unplayed video game uh, or game only exists uh, as, as a static uh, thing and it's in fact a very sad thing if you, if you uh, uh, imagine a, a not played uh, or unplayed game. So only when it is played, it can, uh, the, the game can develop its potential. For the theory of video games, Alexander Galloway, professor in New York, uh, put it in a nutshell uh, when he said video games are actions. Um, and that is precisely what, uh, what the exhibition uh, stands for. So, since the original conception for the exhibition Welt der Spiele, World of Games, um, there have been developments in science, scholarship, uh, art and commerce, and these have considerably inf influenced the new conception of gameplay. Um, in view of the huge cultural and economic significance of video games, not only artists have, to, have started to explore their potentials, like for example Jody um, or Cory Archangel, for example, um, but also a branch of academic inquiry has developed. Game studies, the, this uh, emerging field, um, uh, are concerned with the critical study of games um, including engaging with the question of the meanings of computer games, which is by no means confined to a purely educational perspective. One of the father or rediscovered father figures of recent game studies, by the way, is Johan Hausinga. I learned how to pronounce it correctly. Um, um, and uh, he, of course, is, is one, one of the, yes, w rediscovered um, um, father figures of uh, recent game studies. So, um, game studies, which began to form in 1999, uh, view video games as a rich and multi-layered subject investigating expressive artifacts. The theoretical world, work that has come out of game studies was an important basis for developing uh, gameplay. In the course of developing game theory, art historians in isolated cases, like myself, began to take an interest in the subject from a critical standpoint. The most important outcome, or one of the most important outcomes of this work was to establish that there is indeed a close relationship between interactive media art and games. Lisa asked me uh, beforehand to include some remarks um, regarding the topic of collecting and preserving uh, video games in the context of a museum. And we face problems here 
um, and questions that are not yet solved and will keep us occupied in the next years, I'm sure. Um, for uh, I have no solution, by the way, um, I'm afraid, but I can give you a short overview about the challenges, the challenges we're facing. Um, there are different approaches of, col of collecting video games at the moment. The easiest way, of course, is just to buy the games. Uh, they come in a box, uh, put a signature on, on them and put them in a, in a library of some sort. Uh, the main problem here, of course, is that uh, we have to deal with already um, uh, obsolescence. Uh, games as born digital artifacts that um, um, that uh, may have been released only a couple years of years ago might already be uh, obsolete because they run on obsolete formats or platforms. Already we need specified media archaeological uh, methods to unravel the mysteries of digital obsolescence. Already, now. Um, and this will be, of course, a huge preservatorial problem in the future, I'm sure if we want to guarantee that digital artifacts will not vanish. The next problem is a shift in the distribution of video games. A lot of games at the moment are distributed exclusively via download on the internet and are only accessible through specialized uh, software libraries like for example Steam um, that will be obsolete sooner or later themselves. Um, a lot of games change over the time uh, of their lifespan with updates, patches, additional downloadable content, and so on. And this is a huge challenge in the context of preserva uh, preservation. Is it necessary to preserve every software version of a game, version 1.0, 2.7, and so on? So against obsolescence, there are two basic strategies. The first one is preserving the game's source codes. Preserving the source codes leads to a variety of new problems, I'm afraid. Most of the published video games are, my, are made by corporations. That means uh, we have to deal with um, proprietary software, um, meaning it's licensed software owned by the, by the corporations. And uh, if a museum goes there to a corporation and says, okay, can I have your source code? They will deny, I'm sure. There are open source games, of course, but the majority are products by companies. Artists, on the other hand, are not so keen on giving away their source codes either. Recently, I have bought an artistic video game installation for ZKM by a Dutch artist, Lieven van Feldhoven. Um, and uh, the ZKM, uh, it's in the contract, it receives a copy of the source code in, called, code in the case of the artist's death. Um, so, even if a museum is in the possession of a video game's uh, source code, it is not clear if the codes can be easily compiled in the future. MoMA acquired the source code of Tetris by Alexei Pachitnov, which is a great thing. Um, but if this code um, uh, will be executable in, uh, let's say, 100 years or 10 years, or I don't know, it is uh, completely unclear. You need, um, well, new professions, uh, basically, uh, in the future. Uh, media archaeologists, uh, or, uh, programmers that are specialized on, on, um, on digging up uh, the, the, the lost, uh, the lost uh, digital artifacts, like um, the, the, the um, paintings uh, Andy Warhol did on an Amiga uh, in the early 80s, uh, and this was a project by Golan Levin and Cory Archangel, and they, they managed to make these, uh, these data visible. Um, it's not about a video game, but uh, the, 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 um, I think my, my point is clear um, because this, this data was lost and they had to, to, to invent methods in order to, to uh, make this data uh, executable and visible again. So first strategy by source codes. Other strategies to emulate the games. 
making them executable on other computer systems than they have been originally designed for. And that, of course, is a massive technical challenge. Here we have the classic dilemma, by the way, of the care and preservation of ancient monuments between conservation and reconstruction. So it's the same here. <clears throat> the next problem is the gigantic complexity and vastness of so-called MMOs, uh, so-called massively multiplayer online games, like, for example, the most famous is World of Warcraft. It's a role-playing game played by literally millions of people simultaneously in the world. Um, it, they are connected via a vast network of personal computers and servers, and it is impossible, in my opinion, um, uh, to, to save, to store, and make visible all the data that is generated uh, in a meaningful way. Um, I have read that MoMA has an exhibit about World of Warcraft. Um, they tried, it is unpresentable, basically, this, this uh, Artifact? Is it an artifact? I don't know. It's a, it's an, a vast. It's a network basically, um, and they they solved the tried to solve the problem by storytelling. Um, they produced a documentary about the game in which veterans um, uh, talk about the time they spent immersed in the game world. And that lead, leads me to the next topic. I was asked by Lisa beforehand the role of ethnographic museums and the discipline of ethnography in relation to video games. And uh, video games, and especially game worlds, MMOs, um, are a dedicated ethnographical subject, not only from the view of preserving them, but rather the worlds and communities themselves. When researchers were faced in the early days of game studies, were faced with a new complex artifact of a virtual world, virtual game world, um, with its own complexity, they quickly discovered ethnography as a method of choice. Through ethnography, the complexity uh, of the world's inhabitants, social structures, and culture can be grasped by conducting field studies. So, because it's really close, closed communities, cultures that uh, have uh, emerged and um, um, that, that have, yeah, well, emerged out of the, out of the rule systems um, and the, the, the environments of the virtual worlds. Uh, so a task of an ethnographical museum of the future could be not, to, not only to preserve the digital artifacts and communities, but rather the culture of the virtual society that evolved from the artifact and surrounds it. Um, in 2014, I opened a newly developed exhibition um, for ZKM called Global Games. Um, in the context of ZKM's 300-day art festival, Globale. It's about digitization and globalization, basically. Core elements of Globale um, are visible in video games, too. So um, I curated this um, with, a, with a question, um, how can we see uh, effects of globalization and digitization in, in video games? Um, Computer games, of course, are a child of the digital revolution and thus a medium produced by digitization par excellence. Um, and um, moreover, the apparent uh, paradox of serious play in so-called serious games evidences not only the scientification of our culture um, and, and the trend towards new tools, um, but also a new alliance between art and science. And this is one media theoretical standpoint that Peter Weibel, my boss, actually stands for. Um, computer games transport real world references, meanings, and ideologies, and can hence function as political and social media. Um, social media, not in the sense of uh, Facebook, but uh, socially relevant media, in a positive, enlightening way, or in the sense of seduct seductive propaganda, of course. Games thematize such topics as the Syrian conflict, for example, the de deployment of drones in war zones, for example, here. Uh, Italian video game designer Paolo Pedaccini, La Mole Industria, um, did this game called Unmanned about a 
uh, a drone pilot who suffers from uh, well um, from the fear of castration. So it's a psychogram of of a, of a drone pilot. Um, we have video games that um, that uh, thematize um, um, a globalized economic interconnectedness of international finance, like in Card Life. We have video games that. Uh, show us um, effects of uh, surveillance or that show us the situation of uh, refugees on the European borders or in Africa. Um, they they um, open, uh, some, some game designers and some, some games are open for uh, gender issues um, like, like this uh, wonderful example here, this is uh, Dysphoria by Anna Anthropy, a transgender uh, game designer born male um, who uh, chose a video game as um, her form of expression and um, uh, thinking or, or telling the story of, of her hormone treatment um, through the means uh, of a video game. Uh, a lot of gameplay metaphors here. Everybody is familiar with Tetris, I think, and uh, she, she does this uh, beautiful uh, gameplay me mechanics metaphor, um, uh, um, taking a, a, Tetris, um, a Tetris block that won't fit. And she says, I feel weird about my body, and this is uh, the, such a beautiful uh, gameplay metaphor um, in the game. This game here is called Papers, Please, and um, you have to control passports <laughs> in this game, um, in this uh, uh, fictitious um, uh, a state called uh, Ars Totska um, in 1982 in the Cold War. And uh, you, you see that um, uh, while playing the game um, that uh, you get drawn into this, uh, this a political system that is uh, that is depicted um, uh, in the game, and not only depicted but uh, but s uh, simulated by the by the rule system of the game. Video games show us history lessons, like uh, Peter Brinson's uh, "The Cat and the Coop," um, about the uh, first um, democratically e elected uh, prime minister of Iran. Um, Mohammad Mossadegh, um, uh, who was, um, um, uh, there was a coup orchestrated by, by, uh, by the CIA, why he wasn't, um, why he wasn't, oh, now, now I'm, my English is, uh, is gone at the moment. Um, well, he was not prime minister anymore. Um, Ludwig is a game that is a, um, a tool for learning. Um, you can learn uh, physics uh, with this game, and this is um, done in schools, for example. Oh, five minutes, okay. So, I skip two now. This, in this game here, Biotic Games by Seth Cooper, University of, um, of Washington, um, he um, uh, puts Euglena uh, in a Petri dish, and you can um, control these, these Euglena um, because they are, uh, they are light sensitive, and by, by, by switching on lights uh, on the sides of the Petri dish, you can indirectly control the Euglena, and he does uh, uh, very fun soccer games with, with, these, uh, with these little animals. Um, this game here is particularly interesting, um, a phone story uh, by Paolo Pedaccini, and this game um, shows the production processes of an iPhone. Um, it is uh, played on an iPhone, um, ideally, and uh, the, the left image shows um, how Chinese workers uh, try to kill themselves by 
uh, by jumping from the factories um, in, in China and you have, to, um, you have to catch them, but not to save them, but in order that they can uh, uh, work uh, go back to work, um, and, and the, the right image shows that you have to um, have to force your children, slave workers in in the Congo, uh, to keep mining uh, rare earths, um, uh, in in order to to build your smartphone. And this game was uh, was downloadable um, in on the uh, Apple App Store for four days. And then it was censored. It was um, it was forbidden uh, by Apple um, because they, well, they they um, uh, they the official um, statement was that there is uh, violence depicted against children. Um, one thing is evident, uh, computer games uh, are or can be political media um, and that they apply their own specific means to topics of social and global political relevance. They do so on the one hand in an enlightened manner within the context of, uh, for example, the Games for Change movement and conversely, uh, conversely the procedural rhetoric is also used as propaganda as demonstrated, for example, in a game called America's Army. Um, that is commissioned by the US government as a recruiting tool and distributed free of charge. So the, connected, uh, the connection between computer games and the military context, the military entertainment industrial complex, goes all the way back to the early days of the medium. Um, this is the first video game we know. It's called Tennis for Two. It's from 1958. And this was uh, invented by US physicist William Higginbotham. He constructed uh, the video game Tennis for Two, the prototype of all video games in, um, uh, uh, in the context of an, um, uh, of an uh, open doors day of his laboratory. Uh, in 1945, Higginbotham headed uh, the electronics department, by the way, of the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos. Uh, in New Mexico, and this, in this context, the invention of the computer game has been called an arms byproduct, so Rüstungsabfall in German. Um, in, this me in his media theoretical commentary, Friedrich Kittler um, generalizes with respect to the military industry and the media, uh, quote, the entertainment industry is, in any conceivable sense of the word, an abuse of army equipment. Um, so in German, Unterhaltungsindustrie ist in jedem Wortsinn Missbrauch von Heeresgerät. In the independent scene, there are si independent video game scene, there are signs of an emerging awareness for anti-war games, as demonstrated, for example, um, by this war of mine, by a Polish uh, game company, with a change of perspective in the game, because uh, usually in mainstream video games you play the soldier um, uh, in a war zone, but here you play a group of civilians um, in, uh, you, you have to survive in, in a, in a uh, post-war zone. September 12th by uh, Gonzalo Frasca, uh, Uruguayan uh, game scholar and designer, uh, uses the simple caricature uh, to present the spiral of violence uh, propelled and entrenched by the US war on terror. Um, this here is interesting, it's called Faith Fighter. Um, while referencing such genre classics as Street Fighter II, this beat em up game does an ironic take on their stereotypical and even racist portrayal of fighters uh, from around the world. And uh, as it pits uh, representatives of the major world religions against each other. Jesus, Jesus faces off against, among others, Buddha and Mohammed. The game has a playable caricature of the prophet. Um, it is, of course, an ethical and political question whether the game should be exhibited at ZKM. We show a censored version um, in which the prophet's face is obscured. Um, I know you have the sign, but one more example. Um, uh, computer games are not a purely Western phenomenon. Um, we must consider them as a global medium, and games are produced and played all over the world. Uh, little known are computer game productions from the Arab world and the Near East. Two noteworthy examples are from Syria and Iran. Uh, here published by Syrian game developer Dar al-Fikr uh, and played from a Palestinian perspective, the shooter Under Ash uh, stages the battle against Israel 
during the Second Intifada from 1999 to 2002. And the Iran Computer and Video Games Foundation promotes uh, Iranian games, presenting them at such computer game trade fairs uh, as the Gamescom, for example, in Cologne. And now the last, my last remark um, is about considering the example of Under Ash, this game, Under Ash, um, we clearly see that games, both serious and commercial games, are ideological political spaces. They frame our perspective on the other, and they are virtual worlds that aim to convince players of certain ideas. Contrasting Under Ash with the example of the game America's Army here, that I mentioned before, makes my point even clearer. Uh, America's Army is a game that was commissioned by the US Army as a marketing and recruiting tool. You can play as an American soldier against so-called opposing forces that are not identified any further. It is a multiplayer game. One significant aspect of the game is that a player can only play as a US, as an US soldier, never as the enemy. Meaning, if two people uh, play against each other, each one sees herself as American, although the other is always depicted as the enemy. Um, this perspective is unchangeable, hardwired in the program's code. Under Ash um, and America's Army present two different concepts of the enemy that are politically motivated, of course. Uh, the examples show that we as researchers have a responsibility putting video games under critical scrutiny. Thanks.